Chapter 8 Mom? Dad? Sterling popped her bag on the bench in the entryway as she crushed forward into the farmhouse. She had not given them any notice that she was coming home. An empty space caught her eye where an antique cupboard used to stand. Looking around the room, she could see a few more empty spaces where antiques used to be. Sarah! her mother Paisley exclaimed as she came from the kitchen. You're home! Sterling let herself be wrapped up in a big hug, embracing her mother in return. You sold great-grandma's cabinet? Paisley's smile dimmed a little. It had to be done. When? Sterling knew that her mother had loved that particular piece of furniture. A few months back. You know Eunice Brown had her eye on it for a long time. Paisley pointed to the crutches that Sterling used. What happened? Sterling groaned. It's a long story. You can tell it over dinner. Paisley unwrapped an apron from around her slim form. I was just about to call your father. He's struggling over some safety forms in the den. I will go surprise him and let him know dinner is ready. Sterling gave her mother a smile and another hug. I've missed you guys. Paisley laughed. You were here for the holidays. However, you're always welcome to be here since we miss you all the time. Sterling crutched over to the den, knocking on the door. Surprise! Owen Hawkins looked up in astonishment. Sarah Lee, when did you get home? Just now. Sterling grinned as her dad gave her a hug. Mom says it's time for dinner. How long are you staying? asked Owen. Will you be here for the town fair? A member of the Hawkins family had been opening the annual town fair since its conception. It was a big deal for the little town. I could probably manage that. Sterling thought that she really had nothing better to do. I know that look. Owen looked down at her in concern. What happened? Let's go to supper. Sterling dredged up a smile. I'll tell you all about it. Including how you got the crutches? Owen turned off the desk lamp. That is the most exciting part. Sterling led the way to the kitchen where her mother had already put out an extra setting. Her brother Brant would be working at the factory as the second shift was his responsibility. They all sat down to enjoy the home-cooked meal. Sterling asked about how things were doing in the small town. She found out that the daycare was rumored to be reducing its staff again. The small town boutique Fleur for her had closed. The tea room and quilt shop had opened the upstairs of the building for a bed and breakfast, which no one in the town thought would succeed. Melody Jesnell and Dixby Cooley were engaged. Dixby and Melody? Sterling looked at her parents in shock. Melody, Dixby, and Brant had been friends for a long time. However, the last she had known it was Brant and Melody who were in love, even if they were not a couple at the time. She could not imagine how Brant must feel. How is Brant coping with that? He's ignoring it, sighed Paisley. We feel for him, but there isn't really nothing to be done. Now, Sarah Lee, Owen clasped his hands and leaned forward. Not that I don't love it when our daughter comes home, but I think it's time you told us what's going on in your life. Sterling sighed. Should I start at the beginning, or would you just like the bad news? I find the beginning is always best. Owen pragmatically replied. She found herself telling them the whole sad tale, from sneaking onto the plane, the crash, hiking through the snow, getting to like Jake Ramsley, the rescue, how Jake had ruined her career, having a little over three hundred dollars to her name, and returning home. I won't have my share of the payment money this month. Will the bank give another extension? It was never your share, Owen said quietly. Well, we desperately needed the money. You should have not felt obligated, Sarah. I'm a Hawkins, she gave a crooked smile. We take care of this town. It's in our blood. Paisley took her husband's hand in her own. It's done, then. Owen put his second hand over their joined ones and nodded. What do you mean? Sterling's smile faded. Is there nothing else we can do? The bank is done giving extensions. They've done all that they are willing to do. Owen took a deep breath. We're underwater with the loans and mortgage. We won't make this month's payments. That meant the factory would close, and over 200 people would be out of work. 
What do we have to do? She asked her parents quietly. We'll take the money that would have been applied for the payment and use it as a bonus for each worker, replied Owen. The bank will get nothing this month, but we'll be able to help our workers a little. Unfortunately, there will be no severance packages. We just don't have the money. You and I can call the employees tonight, Paisley's told Sterling. We'll set up a meeting with everyone to announce the closing. Sterling nodded. She had failed her community. Pendle would soon become a ghost town thanks to her and Jake Ramsley. She knew that it was probably going to be the case when she came home without any money for the payment, but it hurt to hear the reality from her parents. Sterling felt like she had failed them as well. The family set to work, sending out notices to the banks, creditors, suppliers, customers, and companies that supplied services to Hawkins' company. It was late at night when Sterling finally made her way up to her room, her dad bringing up her bags. "'Have you talked to Brant yet?' Sterling sat on the bed, tired from the ordeal of closing the family company. "'How is he taking it?' "'We all knew this was coming,' Owen said quietly. "'Orders are down, expenses are up. Even though he was making headway on getting us more of an online presence and procuring orders that way, Brant knows the deal. He's been a source of strength for us.' I am sorry, Dad. Sterling brushed away a tear. Owen laid a hand on her shoulder. You can't shoulder this, Sarah. Don't let it bury you. We all did our best, but it just wasn't enough. There's no one to blame here. Sterling nodded. She knew the wisdom in her father's words, but she still felt badly. I'll leave you to with your mother, Owen said gruffly as Paisley came in with clean sheets. Wiping away her tears, Sterling helped to make up the bed. Afterward, Paisley sat beside her, putting an arm around her daughter. Don't worry about it. What's done is done, and we'll figure out how to move forward. Now, tell me about this Jake you like so much. You mean the man who threw my career in the trash? Sterling said dryly. The very one. I know your heart, Paisley said gently. Hawkins have a bad habit of loving people who are not always appropriate at the time for them. How were you not appropriate for Dad? Sterling frowned at Paisley's words. I came from a poor family. He had been dating a daughter of the Lockmans, and they had some serious cash which was needed for the business. Instead, he chose me. Paisley rubbed Sterling's arm. Now stop distracting me and tell me about Jake. Is he handsome? Not in a traditional sense, sighed Sterling. I will take that as a yes. Paisley had a sad smile. I liked him. Sterling wiped away another tear and leaned against her mother. She still liked him. She was angry at him. She was sad they had no future. Do we have any ice cream? No, frowned Paisley. I think I have some chocolate chips for baking and pudding cups. That will do. Sterling grabbed her crutches. Come on, let's binge eat while I tell you all the frustrating things about Jake Ramsley. They sat in the kitchen, eating junk food and talking about Jake's smile, humor, ingenuity with the silver pants, and how he kissed. And you never confronted him? Paisley popped a few chocolate chips in her pudding cup. I tried, Sterling said dryly. I yelled at his cousin before calling it quits. It's not like you to quit her mom remarked. She shrugged. Everyone knows Jake has a temper. He has a reputation for squashing people in business if they go up against him. He probably regarded this as business. He believes I lied and manipulated him to get a story. You did, mildly commented Paisley. That does not excuse his behavior, either. He went overboard by making you unemployable in your field. We both were wrong. Sterling had another spoonful of vanilla pudding with chocolate chips. However, I was just doing my job. If I announced I was a reporter from Dubious, he would never have talked to me. Are you going to let him get away with this? asked Paisley. It was obvious she felt that Sterling and Jake had unfinished business. Right now, I want to concentrate on dealing with things here, Sterling said firmly. If I have the opportunity to see Jake Ramsley ever again, I'll deal with him then. After cleaning up their impromptu snack, Sterling climbed the stairs to her childhood room. It held all her trophies, old uniforms, 
and some clothes that she had left behind after her move to New York. Yearbooks were there, along with the favorite childhood books and a teddy bear. Taking the teddy bear down from the shelf, Sterling decided to let her childhood friend spend the night with her, since she wanted some comfort. The next morning dawned bright and sunny, much to Sterling's dismay. She felt like it should be raining to accompany the sadness that her family was facing. Her brother Brant gave her a hug, somber as always. The family managed a light breakfast, no one having much appetite, before heading to the factory. Sterling and Brant spent a little time wandering the floor, reminiscing about the summer she worked there. She breathed in the aroma of different sawdust from different woods, looking affectionately at the machines that she had helped to run, quietly remembering. Now it would all be gone. Brent gave her a one-armed hug, then went to help their father. Owen was finishing up at his desk in the office, getting any important items and paperwork that would be needed before the bank took possession of the property. It was almost time, so Sterling went to wait patiently beside her mother. They had spent yesterday calling each employee at the company. They had fended off questions and statements about the end of Hawkins Fine Furniture Company, instead setting up a time to meet with all employees in the plant cafeteria. At its prime, the company had employed nearly 600 people. Now the town was just only over 700 strong, with more families leaving every week. Hawkins Fine Furniture Company was the town's major employer, still providing for 200 employees. Only now it was closing its doors. As people gathered, they greeted Sterling, many not having seen her for years while she worked on her career. Sterling was happy to renew old acquaintances. From her summers working at the factory family, she knew many of the employees as well. It was bittersweet to see so many familiar faces and know that their livelihood was now gone. Brant and their father entered. Owen Hawkins was red-rimmed around these eyes. It was obvious that he had been crying, but no one remarked on it, letting him save his pride. He wrapped an arm around Paisley and the other around Sterling, surprising her. Somehow she had thought that her father would be the one to make the announcement. Instead, the burden had fallen to Brant, who stepped forward, clearing his throat. "'Most of you have heard the rumors by now. We all knew this day was coming. It was just a matter of when. Hawkins has not been solvent for a long time, nor has it been able to compete in this market. As of today, we are out of business.' Brant paused. I would like to thank all of you for being the outstanding employees that you are. We never would have made it this long without all of you. There was a murmur from the crowd, but most remained respectfully silent. As a thank you for your service, continued Brant, we have scraped together a small bonus to go with each of your final pay. We cannot afford severance packages. No one is more sorry about that than our family. They can't afford severance packages while they go living on that great big farm of theirs? A grumbling voice came from the back of the room. The bank will be seizing the farm tomorrow, Brant replied baldly. His voice was matter-of-fact, even as several people, including Sterling, gasped. Owen's hand squeezed Sterling's shoulder. She had not known it was this bad. She had not known they were going to lose the farm. Mr. Moncton, the bank manager, was kind enough to allow us until then to get our personal effects out of the house before he'll be claiming the property. We've been underwater with our mortgage for some time. Mom and Dad took out the second mortgage years ago to keep the company afloat so the town could survive a little while longer. The Hawkins family has done our best to serve Pendle and its citizens since the town came into existence. It's been our honor to do so, and we apologize deeply for our failure to continue in this role. Brant reached for a box that Paisley held, setting it on a table before him. He plucked out an envelope. In each envelope is your last pay, a bonus, and a letter of reference. He called out names, shaking each man and woman's hand as he gave them the envelope, wishing them all the best. Before long, the rest of the family were shaking hands with the employees as well. Most wished them well with tearful hugs. Very few were upset since everyone had known this was coming for a long time. Finally, the last employee was given their envelope. People filed out of the cafeteria, emptying their lockers, milling about and talking. 
It was perhaps an hour later before Brant was able to go around the factory, shutting off lights, locking doors, and making sure the place was clear. "'Why didn't you tell me about the farm?' Sterling asked quietly. It had been an emotional day, and she felt the weight of it pressing on her. She knew that the farm was heavily mortgaged, but had not realized that they would lose it as well as the factory. "'It was the hard to talk about,' stated Owen. I suppose we were not ready to face up to the fact that we'd lost a home that the Hawkins had family had lived in for generations. Where are we going to go? she questioned. Mabel Talbot has offered us Ma Benson's old farmstead, free of rent for the next three months to help us get on our feet. It works since they're just farming the land and the house is vacant, Paisley said with quiet dignity. There are no jobs in the community, so I expect we'll end up moving. Her parents had lived here all their lives. Sterling frowned. What about your retirement savings? Surely you should both be able to retire. We put them into the factory, replied Owen. We kept the doors open for all those families a little while longer. As a result, her parents were destitute and facing an uncertain future. Brant and Sterling had time in their favor. Owen and Paisley did not. Sterling still had her retirement savings, she thought, with a pang of guilt. They were locked into investments. She could have taken them out with a heavy penalty, but Sterling had kept them there as a last resort. Now they would need to be used for her family's basic survival. She looked at a tired Brant and realized that he had probably not taken a retirement plan. If he had, he would have put it into the company as well. He probably had not taken a full salary over the years that he worked for the company either. No wonder he did not feel right about entering into a relationship with Melody, no matter that they had loved each other for years. Brant probably felt that he had nothing to offer. It was sad. It was even more sad when Sterling said goodbye to her childhood home as she slowly packed up her bedroom. Gumdrop would be taken to a local riding school where she would have a home and care for the rest of her days. Sterling was welcome to visit her old horse there. Brant's horse challenger had already been sold. Everything that was of any value had been liquidated over the years. There were just a few sentimental antiques and regular items left in the house. Some friends were going to help move the heavy items tomorrow morning before the banker came at noon for the keys. Sterling taped up the last box of the items she had intended to keep. The rest would be donated to the local thrift store. Walking across the hall, she offered to tape Brant's boxes. He only had a few. Most of everything else was marked for donations. Traveling light? she asked as she bent over the first box. Brant shrugged as he rolled up a shirt, stuffing it into a duffel bag. When it comes down to it, a person doesn't really need all that much. What about love? Sterling paused in taping the boxes to look up at him. We are not going to talk about that, Brant said tiredly as he stuffed another shirt into the bag. Melody loves you, and you love her. Why are you being so stubborn about this? She wanted to know, her heart aching for her brother. She is engaged, Brant said tersely, emptying a drawer on the bed. Neither of them wants to be engaged. They thought you would be jealous enough to finally make a move on Melody, Sterling explained. Sterling had managed to wrangle the story out of Melody and Dixby, out of an old friend at the factory. When you didn't do anything, Melody's pride got in the way and they've kept it up. Brant ignored her remarks, putting clothes in the duffel and zipping it up. Sterling got up and grabbed his arm, turning him to face her. Brant, you deserve love and happiness. If she makes you happy, then you should be with her. It's not that simple, Sarah, sighed Brant. I have nothing. I owe the bank a debt that I'll never get out from under. I need to earn an income to help support our parents. You heard Dad. They have no retirement anymore. I can't offer Melody a single thing. Marrying her would put her financial future in jeopardy. I won't do that to her. You could declare bankruptcy. Maybe find a place big enough that Mom and Dad could move in for a while. I'll send money when I find a job, offered Sterling. Hawkins pay their debts. His voice was quiet and unmovable. I've lined up a possible job. It's out of state. I'll send money when I can. Brant. Sterling knew that she was not going to change his mind. You're going to regret this. You're making her life miserable as well as your own. He just gave her a hug, picked up his bag, and headed downstairs. 
Sterling sat down on Brant's bed, looking around the empty room. She was going to miss her childhood home. She had always known that things were tight financially, yet she had a wonderful childhood in Pendle. She would miss the doorway where their dad marked down Brant and Sterling's growth heights each birthday. She would miss the breakfast nook where she had teased Brant about his high school girlfriends. She would miss the smell of her mother's banking and their long talks over sappy chick flicks. Not that she hadn't missed those when she left Pendle, but Sterling had always known that she could come back to the farm and recreate many of those memories. Now the farm would belong to someone else. Someone else would swing from the tire swing attached to the big oak in the backyard that her grandfather had planted. Someone else would paint the walls and paint over their heights on the door frame. Someone else would create all sorts of memories here. Wiping away a tear, she decided there was no point in crying. Grabbing the packing tape, Sterling finished sealing the remaining boxes, then brought them downstairs to their allocated piles. One for donation, one for Ma Benson's house, which was much smaller than the farmhouse. "'I hope the next owner has children,' Paisley commented wistfully as she set a box on the growing donation pile. "'I hope they slide down the banister, just like Brant and you used to.' Sterling eyed the boxes as she followed her mother back to the kitchen. Mom, we should sell what's in the donation pile. You need the money. There's no time. Paisley sighed as she grabbed another box off the counter. Besides, who can afford anything right now? The entire town is struggling, and everyone's budgets are going to tighten even further now the factory is done. Best to just donate it. Sterling nodded glumly, grabbing a box as well to put into the pile. There was a knock on the door and soon the house was flooded with women armed with cleaning supplies. Sterling smiled as the group clamored for direction from Paisley and Owen. Someone had hitched a hay wagon to a pickup, and a group of men began dismantling beds and hauling furniture out to go to the empty Benson house under the direction of Owen, carefully situating it on the wagon. It was a regular house-moving party, complete with crockpots plugged in at every available outlet, for when the group was done, they would have a small feast together. This was what Sterling missed about a small community. Everyone might know each other's business, but they were also willing to help each other out as necessary. Sterling was washing a window when there was a crash from behind her. I'm okay, Katie called out as she scrambled to pick up items from the broken box. It was just cutlery. Katie, you've cut yourself. Sterling grabbed a clean rag and pressed it on Katie's thumb. Oh, Katie had to look at the cut sheepishly. That's not too bad. You should have seen what I did a couple months ago. Still, it should be bandaged. Sterling grabbed her crutches, and the two went in search of the first aid kit, which thankfully had not been packed yet. I'm sorry about the factory, Katie commented as Sterling wrapped her thumb in gauze. It is a blow to Pendle, even if we all knew it was coming. Sterling nodded. She did not feel much like talking about the losses of the town. What about you? Anything new and exciting? Katie shrugged. The daycare let me go today? Katie! Sterling looked at her in sympathy and feeling a little guilt. This would be a direct result of the factory closing. Do you have another job lined up? I've been offered something. I'm not sure if it will pay my bills yet, but it's a start. Katie's eyes followed a couple of the guys as they hefted an old dresser out the door. Sterling lowered her voice and leaned toward Katie as she put tape over the gauze. Still pining for Jackson? Katie jumped, jostling the scissors Sterling was holding, causing Sterling to juggle them a moment before getting a firm grip. Katie blushed guiltily. No, not at all. <laughs> it's okay, Sterling smiled, relieved neither of them had cut themselves on the scissors. Really, Katie did have the worst luck. Your secret is safe with me. If I could just stop mooning over him, it wouldn't need to be a secret. Katie sighed and then forced a smile. What about you? Did you meet anyone special in the city? Not at all, Sterling said. She had met Jake on a plane, so that didn't really count. We should get back to work before the rest of the town smells us gossiping. Katie pretended to shudder and agreed. Then they'll demand to know what we're talking about. Sharing a grin, they went to their assigned chores. He could not find her. Jake was getting more frustrated as he searched. 
Online, Sterling Denver was only a tabloid writer. There was nothing about where she grew up, what school she graduated from, or anything beyond ten years ago. Sure, he could see what awards she had won over the course of her career, but there was nothing else. Nothing of any substance. He could not tell if she was married, had children, belonged to any clubs. She had her own fan page on Facebook, but otherwise belonged only to the website of Dubious. Frustrated, Jake decided to try the other name that Sterling had given him. It was probably a lie like the rest of her. He could not believe he was really going to try to contact her and ask for her assistance to try to clear Michael's name. He wondered just how much money it would take to buy her cooperation. He wondered just how much humble pie he was going to have to eat. Jake was certain he was going to have to apologize for what he had done to ruin Sterling's career. He may have gone too far, Jake acknowledged to himself. He had let his emotions rule him and crushed her because he was angry and hurt. It was unlike him. Jake did have a temper, but usually he was able to contain it. He did not like to be crossed. However, he had always handled most situations a lot better than this. What he had done was unworthy of him, unworthy of the Ramsley name. Then again, the Ramsley name was not what it used to be, he reflected. Jake would have to restore her career. Not that he wanted her writing about his family again. He sighed and scrolled through his computer. Sarah Lee Hawkins, Pendle, Ohio. It was her. Jake stopped and stared at the screen, his breath hitching at her picture. She played field hockey in high school and won third place in state competition. Sarah had won awards for speeches and journalism in state college. She worked at her parents' factory, Hawkins Fine Furniture Company, in Pendle during the summers. Her brother Brant still worked at the factory. Only now they didn't. Jake frowned as he clicked another article. The company had closed. The announcement was made today. There was a photo of the family as they told their employees. Sarah was there with them. The furniture company had been in business for 89 years, with a Hawkins at the helm all the time. At its prime, the company had employed nearly 600 people. Now 200 were out of work. The bank had foreclosed on them. What had Max said? That Sterling had declared that he had destroyed an entire town? A sinking feeling invaded Jake's stomach. The town of Pendle was small. Only 750 people at last census. Losing a factory that size in a town that small meant the town was going to go under. It simply could not survive. All those people were going to need to find work somewhere else and would move away. As a result, all the smaller businesses like restaurants, gas stations, hardware stores, and more would lose their customers, causing a domino effect. Had her income been tied to the company? Had she been supporting it and thus people's livelihoods? Had he really destroyed an entire town? Jake picked up his phone to make some calls. He needed to catch a flight as soon as possible. If you enjoyed this chapter of Stranded with the Billionaire, book six of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for the next chapter coming on YouTube. You can always find Stranded with the Billionaire and the other Ramsley series books on Amazon. They're available in Kindle Unlimited, on Audible, and as ebooks or paperbacks for you. Happy reading!